computer. Ah, great, terrific. You're <laughs> terrific, thank you. So I want to go over, um, some of you don't know about the writing and what, um, what I'd like you to think about. So I just am going to spend two, two to five minutes just going over this. Um, so today's the second class, new objectivity. Next week is the third class, new objectivity. And then on Wednesday, March 27th, you're going to present or read an essay, read an essay. So, um, um so the so before you before you read the essay you're going to send me two images okay now the two images uh can be images that i showed or images you find of any of the new objective artists or friends of them Either way. Now, I'm going to try to send you a file of all the pictures. Uh, it, I might be delayed, but I think it should come in the next few days. Okay. When you get the file, you'll see a lot of pictures. In order to send one of those pictures, this is what you have to do. You have to click or double click the picture. Then the picture opens up slightly bigger. And then you you put your mouse, you put your mouse on the picture and you drag it, you drag the picture to your desktop. It, you look like you don't understand what I'm saying, um, Marilyn, but you ask your daughter. You drag the picture to your desktop. Then once it's on your desktop, you can attach it to your email, to me. Okay, you press, you click, click, clickety, 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 and then you attach something from your desktop. You'll now have the picture on your desktop. So you attach that picture and you attach the two pictures that you have and you send them to me, and you should indicate which is on the left and which is on the right. Okay. Um, I think we look at pictures left, right. So the first <clears throat> one is on the left, the second one is on the right. Um, it would be nice if you could say the size of the pictures or have it in what you write. Okay. Um, now, even if some of you have difficulty understanding what an essay is or <laughs> what to write about, it would be nice if you tried, okay? If in trying to write this, you feel like you are getting sick or you <laughs> want to go to a hospital, please stop, stop. OK, some people that I've met have had very bad experiences in terms of writing and literature. And that's really a shame because I think writing is just amazing. Um, uh, it, for instance, the man who wrote the piece on my work, that is a very well written piece of writing. Um, if you could see how he circles back to things how he describes things, how he picked out a theme that made sense and was not a theme that other people would think of. So writing can be a wonderful challenge. There's no grade, there's no, um, this is not snobby, this is not uh, full of airs. So it's just a matter of trying. If you feel uh, that you'd rather not read, um, you don't have to. You could send it to me. Fine. I'll I'll write back to you. Um, but it's nice. It's very nice to hear what other people think. Um, 
So what should you think about when you're writing about the two uh, images? So here's a kind of list, uh, composition, color, scale. Scale means how big they feel, okay? Or how big they actually are. Um, the form, poetry, emotion, the use of paint, tonality. Tonality means black and white, grays. Um, expression, um, space, how the space is used. Design, texture, empathy. Do you feel empathy for the person in in the um, for the artist and for the person depicted? Um, psychology, volume. Is is it believable? Does it have roundness? Does it have weight to it? Um, does it have pulse? Here's a good one, insight, insight. What is the artist telling you? What do you want us to think about your insight? Again, to come back to this writer who wrote this essay, I thought his insight was uh, fantastic. I mean, he really, he really dug deep to figure this out. Um, I write here the depiction of the eye. Uh, I like the way eyes look. I like the way they um, they speak. I like the way they communicate. So I would I would urge you or suggest to you to look at the eye. Um, the drawing underneath the painting or the drawing with the paint. Um, whichever component speaks to you. I mean, you could, you could do poems if you want. You can, I don't know, you could do little pictures. Uh, it's just, I want to, you to respond to what you're feeling. Okay. Um, so the images, you'll see the images, they'll come up left and right. And then you'll speak. And you don't have to use an essay. You can just talk off the top of your head or talk with some notes. Thing is that you, you should limit what you're saying to three or four minutes, more or less. That some of you are gonna find hard, but you should, you should make this austere, pared down not meandering. Um, and the sequence of the presentation will follow how you send it into me. So one person already sent, already sent in the pictures. So the pictures indicate she's number one. Then she'll figure out her essay or figure out what she's writing. That's the first one. Whoever wants to follow would be the second one, third, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have a special request, like you have to come late or you have to leave early, tell me because then I'll rearrange it so you're definitely there. Um, if you send the images first, that's probably better. Um, and then write afterwards. Um, that's pretty much what I feel to say. Um, do, do, do you have a question? Does anyone have a question? No? Okay, all right. So, um, does anyone have a question on the class last week? Looks like Marilyn might have a question, but you're muted, Marilyn. No, you have to. Uh... Marilyn. There... Yes, what? Go ahead, go ahead. My question is, do 
do you hear an echo when I'm speaking now? No. 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 That, that's what I want you to know. That that's you. great. That's great. That's but great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Very sharp. Thank you. Um, now, um, can I, I, I felt like I didn't call on a few people last time to make sure that they don't have questions or if they do have questions or what they're thinking. So, um, Evelyn, did you have a question? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Okay, I mean, so I, I probably Evelyn, should, but I, I, I don't. So <laughs> no, Evelyn. Evelyn, you you said to me that um, a lot of the artists you don't know. Uh, a, a lot of the artists um, are, are new are, to you. Are new, are to, new you. to me. Some yeah. of them, yeah. Yeah, that well, that's very good. That's very good. Um, okay. And um, so. Uh, <laughs> Mary, do you have a question? No. Okay. I just want to make sure that everyone's kind of involved here. Um, oh, Frank, did you have a question from last week? No. 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 Okay. okay. Uh, all right. All right. Okay. So now, um, so let me let me just say something. Uh, if you if you um, listen to the recording last week, um, part of the recording was missing uh, because of my uh, ineptness with the computer. And I was rescued by Carol here, who, who told me that she didn't think it was being recorded. So um, the, the idea behind this is that there is it behind this theme is that there is a movement called new objectivity. It's usually connected with German art. It's in fact, it is connected with German art and it has a name in German, in German which is called Neue Sachlichkeit. Um, and, um, but for many years, it occurred to me that character of these artists existed in other countries and in other people. And it's a particular kind of character. So it's a character which is a kind of very naturalistic, very peered down art, very austere, something which is modern, but yet figurative and usually defined as German, but you saw other connections with other artists last time. So um, I find that I find the whole thing very interesting. And I actually think that whatever work that I do could be considered part of that. Um, okay, so so last time I began with Otto Dix, and the second artist was um, Andrew Wyeth. So I don't know what Andrew Wyeth would have made of this, and I don't know what his granddaughter would make of this, but I think it's correct. And it would be interesting, actually, to hear what the granddaughter would make of this, but that's another story. So I have a, a, another grouping of artists, uh, six again, and- um, um, Simon, can I ask you a question? Um, yeah, yeah. You, um, still trying to sort out what new objectivity is, if I could identify it by looking at an artist, and I'm not there yet, um, but I'm thinking, is it, an, um, is it a reaction to expressionism? Yes. Yes, yes. In other words, it's taking away adornments. It's taking away the extras and getting down to a kind of uh, bone hard austerity. Okay. And it's, it, it can be very charged, though, too. Yeah, very charged. And that's what I like about it. 
I like the electricity that comes in. That's what appeals to me. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, and it's a way of depicting the human being, but it's not going back to 1840. It's, it's a way of depicting the human being in a contemporary modern setting. Mm -hmm. now, now, there'll be some runoff between new objectivity expressionism, new objectivity um, surrealism, new objectivity um, magic realism. There, there'll be a little blurring of the lines but I think you'll understand the thrust of this. In other words, it's we're not talking about um, a computer definition of this. It's kind of an approximate idea, okay? At least from my end. And I I find it interesting. I hope you're with me. You know, I hope you're along for the ride. Uh, <laughs> So, so the artists that we're going to look at tonight are Mario Cironi, S I R O N I, Felix Nussbaum, um, German, uh, Conazio de San Pietro, Italian, uh, Dangi. Italian, uh, Max Beckman, and George Tucker. So, um, is there an is there any questions now? Simon, yes, Simon. yeah. Why why did you group them this way? Is there a thought process to how you've grouped them the sixes the sixes how why i i sequence them like this you sequence them. um well i i think in general i like the last ones to be very strong so i like it to leave you with a like a ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Like that. I like that whole idea. I like it in class. I like it in general. Um, I think I thought of how they speak to each other. So um, when we get to Dangi, who maybe is slightly questionable, but Dangi is a little bit like Felice Caserate. And Dangi is a lot like George Tooker. Yeah. So I thought that they speak to each other in some sequence. Okay. Um, I also don't know enough about this to say for sure, but I would guess that the same relationship took place in literature and in poetry, and in other art forms with new objectivity. And that's what I was trying to ask last week to some of the poets. And so, Evelyn, uh, would you th remember, you remember I asked about that, Evelyn, last week. And so, I don't know if you thought about it, but it would seem to me that there probably are poetic equivalence of new objective artists that group themselves together or connected with this idea. Do you think I'm correct? Uh, it's worth looking into. I mean, we okay. can certainly do a little research. Give it a shot. Give, sure. give it a shot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to continue then. I have to share the screen. And this is where I'm at. Okay. So, um, so this is Mario Cironi, 1885 to 1961. Now, 
I have to admit that some of these artists I know a great deal about, and some of them I know very little about. So I don't like to make up things. I will just say that this is an artist that I know very little about, but I like his work. And <clears throat> if you remember um, Casarate and the um, abstraction in Casarate, I think he connects very well with that. So there is a um, direction in new objective art, which deals with form, uh, blunt, abstract form. And so the form part is a way that the new objective artists related to contemporary abstraction. So they were influenced by abstraction, but yet they were figurative. In other words, some of the pure abstractionists, like, say, Rothko or Jackson Pollock, they're non-objective. They're completely outside the figurative tradition. So th the influence of abstraction is very clear in Cironi's work and in Casarate. So what I, what I ascertained about Cironi is, well, I, I, this is just my, my, my take on it, is his work is figurative, but he uses blunt, abstract forms, very weighty and sculptural. He worked in easel painting and in murals. And the thing that I didn't realize about him uh, until I read about this in, from last week to this week is that he was a supporter of Mussolini. Okay. Now, um, being a supporter of Mussolini is fundamentally different than being a supporter of Hitler. Okay, you have to understand that. And for the president of the United States to have said that he supports Hitler is very different than if he said, I support Mussolini. Okay, both are crazy, but supporting Hitler is beyond crazy. It's like nuts. So um, what I like about Cerrone is this form, which is very big and blunt and uh, strong. So here are some examples of Cerrone's work. Um, this one is, is very strange and um, has the same type of form, but even beyond the form, there's a kind of um, surreal. Di diverse, diverse uh, gender thing going on. Um, I, I would love to see this one in person, this one here. Um, but you'll see the same characteristics in his work, even for landscapes, even for buildings. Um, one of the artists that I didn't include in the 18 that I selected is an artist that I think he he became a good friend of, whose name is De Chirico. Yeah. And he would have easily been one of these artists, but I somehow skipped my mind and I just went with these. Um, okay. So in the conversation last week, we spoke about naturalism, abstraction, things like that. 
uh, these these paintings are definitely not naturalistic. They are uh, at the other end of the visual range from naturalism. So this is self-portrait of Cerrone. Um, okay, the next artist some of you saw in the previous class or the class before that, I can't remember now. And this artist is Felix Nussbaum. So Felix Nussbaum, N-U-S-S-B-A-U-M, 1904 to 1944 dies very young and quite tragically. Um, very expressive, passionate, and melancholy work. German-Jewish background. Surrealistic and expressionistic, but definitely part of this new objectivity. His biography is quite amazing. It is worth reading about, um, uh, exceptionally interesting. Um, I have a book that I mentioned last term or the term before, which is quite a thick book. And it's, um, I think it's published by Overlook Press. And it deals with um, Felix Nussbaum's life. And it also deals with new objectivity. Um, he painted uh, a good deal of his life, maybe 10 years of his active adult life in Brussels in hiding. His work is a relatively recent discovery. Okay, I don't think I knew of him past 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And... Um, the first time I saw his work, I was extremely struck by it. I never heard of him. And um, it, it's um, incredibly engaging. And um, it, it speaks to something very deep in our psyche. Um, so he paints in hiding in Brussels. And... Um, so many of these paintings were done in that manner. Um, he's not, um, he's, he's really not thinking of a gallery or of exhibiting his work, but he's compelled to do the work. And um, in the end, um, I think he is sent on the last transport to Auschwitz and dies there. And many members of his family passed away there. So in some sense, he's an example of um, what art is and what the meaning of art is and why do art. Um, That's a very big question, and I, we can't spend a lot of time on that, but that's really the question here. Um, this is a self-portrait, and you can see his identification and um, the yellow star and the uh, identity pass. And these paintings are not big. They're I'd say 18 by 24, 16 by 20, something like that. This is another painting of uh, Felix Nussbaum. It, it, it doesn't entirely make sense to talk about composition regarding his work because it's so um, 
<clears throat> it's so deep. It almost feels um, absurd to mention that a kind of how the composition is constructed. But um, the idea that the the two individuals are so close to the bottom and so close to each other, and there's this high space in juxtaposition to them is um, very striking and beautifully composed. I'm going to guess that this is his girlfriend who then became his wife. Uh, this one is very stunning. And um, I the first time I saw this painting, I visited the Neue Gallery and um, but that's a terrific gallery, terrific museum. Um, I have many books from them, and their exhibits are exceptional. They're on 86th Street and 5th Avenue. It's not a very big museum, but they really put on wonderful exhibits. Um, the first time I saw this painting was there. And I just turned a corner, and there it was looking at me. And it was so surprising. So uh, moving, looking at this. And um, I think this relates to a camp that he was in, uh, I believe in France. And then he somehow escaped from this camp. My instinct is we're going to hear more and more about him and his work. So his early work is, um, well, all of his work is surrealistic, but this is, this is maybe you can sense more surrealism in it than those other works. Um, it, he, was, um, he was heading, it, you could see this direction in his work, still life and simple objects, simple objects, given a, a charge to it. So that would fit right into new objectivity. Um, and so there's in the in the early stages of his work, there's paintings like this. And then as he goes, he's developing, he's going in this direction. And so as the war continues and his being in hiding continues, he finds his voice, which is this voice. So you could say that he's very lucky as an artist, he found this voice, but you could say that as a human being, he was very unlucky to have found this, these events. Um, I would say that this is very ironical, but it's tragic, really. Um, some of these self-portraits are quite striking. Again, not very big and um, very foreboding quality. So again, this... Um, this represents the other side of his art. And there's something about this painting that makes me think of Frida Kahlo. And certain of Frida Kahlo's paintings would fit right in with this. In fact, there's a painting that she did of her feet in a bathtub with imagery around her feet. It's a wonderful painting, and I think it's called what the water gave me. It's worth looking looking at. Um, um, another painting of um, Felix Nussbaum. Uh, in the last year or two years of his life, his work gets more and more agitated and more and more uh, tragic. 
Simon, was that a, a self portrait? I I don't think so. I, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm really not sure, but I don't think so based on what he looks like, what this person looks like. Uh, I, I don't know. I, uh, um, so in these paintings, um, I don't think that these paintings could could have been done except for someone living through this or someone being having their life impinged upon by these events um it it could be that much of this is from collages or photographs or whatever but the sense of it is um an intimate connection with an event or uh, a time a period of time So these are these are really almost the last paintings that he does, and um, um, they are quite haunting. And I think more is going to come out about his life. Uh, there is a museum in Germany, in the town that he grew up in. His name skips my mind for a second. It was something like Oberstruck. But it, it wouldn't be difficult to find this out. But the, the, the museum is designed by an American architect. And um, it looked very interesting. Looked like something would be very interesting to see. So this is, this is I think, the last of the slides I have of his. Of his. And um, you can see him at the bottom with a green beret on. I think uh, the creation of art is uh, mysterious and um, why artists do the art is mysterious and his, his work speaks to what art is and why do it and um, it's a very good um, uh, argument or um, suggestion about why. Um, okay. Uh, so the next artist is Conazio de San Pietro. So Conazio is C O G. N A C C I O, then small d I, then S A N P I E T R O, C O G N A C C I O, then D D I, then San Pietro, eighteen ninety seven to nineteen forty six. Now. Um, this is a, a funny thing to say uh, here, but um, I know very little or nothing about this painting. I came across it when I was looking for things to show, and I was very struck by it. So you have the frankness uh, uh, that I don't really know much about this. I think the name of the painting in Italian translates to the survivor or the victim. Um, but the painting has all of the um, edginess of this artist and hyper-realism of the artist. And I think in that way, it's a very good example of his work. So this artist, um, uh, this is a self-portrait of Conazio di San Pietro. 
Uh, so it's very, very real and um, a bit upending and slightly glassy looking in the rendering, um, but um, very austere and taken very far. Uh, almost looks like a Northern European painting, but painted by an Italian. So this also is the same artist. Very pared down reality and fits right in with um, new objectivity. Um, the This still life is also, um, sorry, the still life is also one of his paintings. And you can see in the still life, the way the forms separate, the way they separate from the cloth, from the plate, they, at the edges, they sort of pull away, pull forward. They're very slightly hyperreal, but yet painted. Um, he does a series of nudes that are extremely interesting. And that's what I really know about his work. So we'll come to a few. Here's one of them. Um, and then there's this portrait. His, the space in his paintings is very shallow, not a lot of distance, very much up close. Now, it, this is a this is an interesting painting. Um, again, a number of objects that are very real separating from the world that they're in and these kids. Um, this is strange. A reproduction of this painting is up in my studio, perpendicular to the painting that I'm working on. Okay, is, isn't this funny? Perpendicular to the painting that I'm working on. Uh, sometimes I'll put things up, which I see that seem to send rays out, like vibrations out to me when I'm sitting in this room by myself with these kids. Um, he is one of the nudes that, that I, I like as one of his strongest pieces. Um, I could not find a lot of his paintings. As much as I like them, this is, I couldn't find more than these. So I would love to see a book, a good book on his work. It would be very interesting. And this one I think is stunning. Uh, um, I think the whole idea of it and the whole, um, depiction and the follow through and everything about it is those, stuff. it's like a dream are those playing cards playing cards yeah yeah i think the painting is called after the orgy <laughs> but yeah. I, I don't even think it needs that name it's like no. it's no. just a very alluring and um disarming painting yeah. And this would be, I think, um, a great example of new objectivity. So it's figurative, it's contemporary. It's not about um, helping humanity. 
uh, it's not about sentiment. It's not about um, religion. It's not a review of the art from 18 something. It's something new, contemporary and modern. And it is um, meant to sit with abstraction and other mm. contemporary artist uh, directions as an equal. And I, I think it's very striking, this, this one. Um, well, maybe I should stop at this point and ask if anyone has a question or if anyone hates this or if, if, uh, if you're along. Um, I just like to um, mention that the self, the first uh, painting by Felix Nussbaum that you yes. showed yes. was actually hung in the uh, exhibit on Auschwitz at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in one of the first galleries. Oh, that's terrific. I, I wish I had known about that. Yeah, he would. Uh, yeah. How did it, how did it look? It looked very much in place. It was, <laughs> you know, that that room. Sh there was a wall that showed um, art of um, people who had experienced the Holocaust, and that painting was given, you know, a lot of good wall space. Well, it could almost be a, a an emblem of a period of time. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to remember everyone. Uh, um, Frank Horton, do you have a question or comment? Uh, I, I was going to ask. You know, um, are there is there a character type for uh, different nationalities within New Objectivity? Like, are did the Italians all seem to that's share? Ah, uh, that's a great question. That's terrific. Uh, well. I think there is, but um, I'd be, I'd be, you, you'd be dealing with a stereotype if, if um, I, I definitely think there is. I think there's something somewhat different about the Italian participants and the German ones. Okay, um, let's come back to that question. Because the next one you're going to see is, is an Italian. Yeah. Okay, let's come back to. That. I'm not avoiding the question, but it's a terrific question. And and there is a difference between the the direction of northern art and the direction of southern Italian art. Mm. That that that's definite definite different direction. And then there are some Italian artists who appear northern, and some northern artists who appear southern. It, it is very interesting. Yeah. 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 It, um, now, the other Frank, do you have a question? No, I don't. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 So let's go on to, um, this is um, Antonio Dungi. Well, I mean, you know, as soon as I see this, you could see the the this is Italian. This is a definitely Italian look to it, but it's more um, cooler than I would think Italian to be. But it feels Italian. Okay, uh, so this is Antonio Dongi, D O N G H I. Uh, his dates are eighteen ninety seven to 1963. I think he's a very interesting figurative artist. His work is very pared down, very abstract. And his abstraction connects to me with Casarate. And it also connects with George Tooker, who comes after. His work is very refined, very perfectionistic. And it also in some ways feels like 
naive art, um, maybe heading in the direction of Henri Rousseau. So here are some pictures of um, Dongi. This is a self-portrait. Yeah, this to me looks very Italian, or it almost looks um, South American, maybe Mexican. The very, very simplified forms, but particular people, very particular, very specific people. <laughs> if some of you know the work of William Bailey, it, it, it almost seems a little bit like William Bailey's paintings, except that this looks like it was done from life and William Bailey's from his imagination. Simon, this, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That looked like a very modern version of an old Italian painting. Yes, yes. Like something that would be done in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, sort of hopper esque, no? Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I'm surprised to see you. I was able to hop on. Sorry to be so late. Oh, good, good. Now, what were you saying? Hopper esque. Hopper esque, yes, yes. <clears throat> but getting back to Frank Horton's question about uh, the difference in nationalities, the question is great. If you remember the first. Uh, slide that I showed of um, Otto Dix. If you remember that woman in that slide, the woman that I said, he walked over to her and he said, I must paint you. I must paint you. You represent the era. Mm -hmm. Think of the difference between that painting and this. And you have German and Italian. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's somewhat sweeter quality to this. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if I could get back to the other one, and I'm afraid of dislodging this whole thing. It's the one with the eyes. She's sitting at the cocktail table. Yes, and her hands are very pronounced. Okay, so this is the last one of Dungi. And um, again, very simplified forms. Uh, is there a question or someone want to add something? Um, Rita? No. No. Okay, good, good. All right, so the next artist that I have is Max Beckman. Max Beckman, 1884 to 1950. <clears throat> so this is the first Max Beckman painting. Um, now, last week... I think there was some discussion about naturalism and abstraction. And you could really see the difference between the two in Max Beckman's development. So this is very naturalistic. 
And this painting, very well-known painting of Max Beckman, is completely not naturalistic, okay? This one, very naturalistic. This one has a different uh, well that things come from. So this is an earlier painting. And in general, there's not a 100% hard and fast rule, but in general, an artist's development usually goes from more naturalistic to more abstract. Okay, this is just my opinion. I don't know if I've ever read anything about this, but it's just my opinion. So Max Beckman, um, fantastic draftsman. You should look up his drawings, his prints. I only have 10 images to show, but he is a major league draftsman. Um, he does many self-portraits. I would say in excess of 100. This is amazing. And his um, these self-portraits rank right up with Rembrandt and Van Gogh. They're, they're really amazing. Uh, his work is very abstract, even though this doesn't look it but also figurative. So Max Beckman's life is amazingly interesting, uh, uh, really, really interesting. He um, flees Germany. He is German. He flees Germany. He has been identified in Germany as a degenerate artist. He is in, they put together an exhibit of what they don't like in art, degenerate artists. And um, we may be having that in the next four years. Yeah. Okay. He puts together this exhibit. Uh, no, not he, but the Nazis put together this exhibit. And he sees the uh, handwriting on the wall. He flees to Amsterdam. He spends, I think, the next 10 years in Amsterdam. Um, and there was an exhibit that I saw in Amsterdam called Max Beckman in Exile. It was at the Van Gogh Museum. So um, after he's in Amsterdam for 10 years, he moves from there to St. Louis. He's invited to teach in St. Louis in I think 1947, he some people who are collectors of his work um, kind of help him get to St. Louis, help him get this teaching position. And they are quite well-to-do collectors. One of them is a man named Morton May, who's the um, was the head of May's department stores had a big collection of Beckman who, and then donated it to the St. Louis Museum of Art. He leaves St. Louis in 1950. And in 1950, he teaches at the Brooklyn Museum Art School. And when I went to the Brooklyn Museum Art School, right in the um, entranceway, there was a large photograph of Max Beckman teaching, okay? He, he did not speak English, okay? And you'll see this guy was like uh, from another world. He went to the studio, uh, the student studios, uh, with his wife, whose name was Quappi, Quappi, Q-U-A-P-P-I. And she translated for him his uh, different statements about what the students were doing. Um, there, there was, when I went to the school, a Max Beckman scholarship, a very prestigious scholarship to go to the Brooklyn Museum Art School, all expenses paid. And in 1950, he's 
he has an he has a painting on exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He lives in Manhattan, I think in the 60s. He's walking down the street in Manhattan in 1950, has a heart attack and dies. Okay, so this is quite amazing considering he starts out in Germany and his work is, I think, prototypically German. His work is blunt and figurative, in part very German and in part influenced by Matisse. There was an exhibit of his work at Gagosian Gallery, G-A-G-O-S-I-A-N. It's a very fancy gallery. And of all, of all things, they had an exhibit of his self-portraits, about 40 self-portraits. There is a catalog for that exhibit, which is wonderful. I, I have that catalog. It's a wonderful catalog. So there were many, many paintings, drawings, sculptures, and the work is so weighty that I, I imagine that if one of the paintings fell off the wall and hit the floor, it would dent the floor. It would leave a hole in the floor. Um, he... He did an interesting thing as a teacher. Uh, I guess maybe I'm guilty of that too, but um, I was very struck by this. Um, he often, instead of talking about art um, with the students, he would recommend a book for them to read. Now, isn't this interesting? As a class in painting and drawing, he had a student that he liked or that he thought had potential, he would say to the student, read this book, you're going to like it, and it's going to mean something for you. It's a very interesting counterintuitive idea. It would be almost like if you said to a student of literature, look at this painting, okay, it would be the opposite. Um, He writes something, I think there's something written, which is like um, Letter to a Young Painter by Max Beckman. And he says in the letter, as a true painter, think as a true painter thinker, painter dash thinker. Uh, or maybe this is in the introduction. As a true painter thinker, he strove to find the hidden spiritual dimension in his subjects. It's a very interesting statement. As a true painter thinker, he, Beckman, strove to find the hidden spatial, uh, spiritual dimension in his subjects. So um, this painting, uh, I should say something about uh, it's quite well known, and um, it's not huge, but it's not small. I would say maybe 24 by 36, th 36 high, 24 wide, something like that. Uh, him, self-portrait, almost bursting out of the painting. And um, I don't think that this is such a good reproduction. It's maybe too red but it's it's okay it's okay um but the the instrument that he's holding or the horn wh whatever whatever you want to make of it it always seemed to me that this person is listening to the sounds that are coming the sounds in the world that are coming The sounds of war, the sounds of um, uh, complete disruption. This is a very small painting, and this was in the last exhibit at the Neue Gallery. It's quite small, maybe 12, 15 inches high. 
a very explosive paintings and very explosive personality. To me, his his head sort of looks like a coconut. He he looks like get out of my way. I'm coming through. Um, this one uh, is very striking, and um, I got a note uh, um, before the class started from. Um, um, I think it was me, Simon. I, yes, I just from saw you, this. from you, from you. I just saw this somewhere, and I can't place where it was. It was in Harvard. It was at Harvard. It was at Harvard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you wrote to me that you turned the corner and you saw this painting. And there, there it was. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's very striking. Very, very striking. large. Yeah, yeah, very striking. Um, all these paintings were in that exhibit that I saw, which I, I believe there's a catalog of. I mean, there is a catalog, but but I think it's still available. Um, this is a very well-known painting of Max Beckman called The Night. And again, you could see this very, very close space. Uh, almost a uh, right, R-I-T-E. I think the underpinning of his work is the drawing, and um, uh, he's a terrific draw uh, drawer. So in his landscapes, you could see the same blunt abstract form. I put together two um, drawings. Uh, well, actually, these aren't drawings. These are prints. But you could see the, the drawing quality in these. Um, Simon, do you know where that landscape is, what it's, where it is? Not the painting, what is, what is, where is this place in the landscape? I don't know. I okay. honestly don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, uh, this looks like a print. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think this is a print. And this one. Uh, oh, I should mention this, this also. Uh, when I was an art student, I didn't understand his work. I didn't relate to it. Um, and it took me a number of years for me to understand what he was doing, what, what he was bringing to the figurative tradition. Um, that's an interesting theme to be explored at some other point. In other words, how you have to be ready to look at someone's work and you may not be ready. We may never be ready. This is the, um, I believe this was the cover of the catalog for the exhibit that I mentioned. Oh, maybe I went away too quickly. In many paintings have a ground that is worked off of. And it, in other words, a color as a starting point. And that color peers through. Um, and in his case, I believe the ground was this um, kind of magenta color. You can see it in his shirt underneath the blues and in his neck and even in his, his head, but especially it, underneath his shirt, next to the blues. 
Uh, this one is quite fascinating, I think. Uh, this one here. Um, so, from my end, um, I, I don't know if I'm right about this, but uh, the artist as an acrobat or as a trapeze swinger, the vulnerability of the artist, everyone is looking, everyone is looking, looking for you to make a mistake, looking for you to fall. His work is very psychological. And um, once I got into it, I, I was really hooked. Um, Okay, so the last the last uh, uh, artist that I have is George Tooker, and George Tooker is nineteen twenty to two thousand eleven, so he lives to be ninety one. Uh, dies relatively recently. Very mysterious, very enigmatic artist, American. Um. I guess he occupies the world of very clear and very unclear, um, lucid and enigmatic, um, a kind of dreamlike quality, figurative, but kind of dreamy. Um, his work is modern, I think, and modernist and all that, not very large. Um, here's a quote from him, which is very interesting. So this is George Tooker. I am after painting reality impressed on the mind so hard that it returns as a dream. But I am not after painting dreams as such or fantasy. It's a very interesting quote, a very smart man, very literate. I am after painting reality impressed on the mind so hard that it returns as a dream. But I am not after painting dreams as such or fantasy. I, I, I'm sorry, someone, a question? Is it an interesting quote, I think? Uh, don't you think, uh, um, yeah. Rita? Uh, yeah. I, I had the good fortune of meeting George Tooker uh, a few times, and he actually was kind enough to write a, a, a small epigraph introduction for the first book on my work. And um, I was very struck by this man. Um, and Renee and I went to visit him once in... Um, Vermont, and we sat around a table, and he made soup, soup for us, and we had the soup, and there was no electrical lights going, and the, it kept on getting darker and darker and darker, and um, it, we were just sitting there drinking soup and uh, having the soup, and um, uh, if I didn't say anything, he didn't say anything either. We just sat there drinking the soup. And um, it was really highly memorable. Um, uh, oh, and we sat in tree trunks. They were like tr bottoms of trees carved out so you could sit in them. Uh, a real character. Um, so, so um, oh, this is not the first one. This is the first one. So his work... Um, is mostly, almost 100% from his imagination. This particular one is not. This is a self-portrait, it round in this manner, and, and um, with these kinds of tones. Um, he paints in egg tempera. So this is the, uh, the, the medium that Andrew Wyeth used and he paints on wood panels. Uh, so tempera is a paint that is uh, achieved by mixing 
pigment powder with the yellow of the egg. Um, and um, it involves many, 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 many coats of paint. It's not, um, it's a very uh, structured way of paint. It's not impetuous. These, these paintings could be impetuous, but it wouldn't be in terms of the paint stroke. It would be impetuous in terms of a flash of insight, a, a subject, a, a something that he had to work on. So you could see the difference between this painting and this one. So this one, um, I'm pretty sure is done out of his head. So in part, this painting looks a bit like him and actually looks a lot like his sister. Um, and it also reminds me of the artist, if some of you remember this, George de la Tour, uh -huh. whose work is, is in shadow, luminous and shadow, very mysterious. And these are very well composed. It, they're small, but they're very well composed. Look at how the rectangle is used to crop all of this. And the light is incredible. Um, so the early work of George Tooker is full of tension and a sort of um, psychology and pressing kinds of needs, pressing things on your brain, on your body. And this would be one example. This is another example, and this the next painting is usually up at the Metropolitan Museum, but not always shown. Um, this is a very, very interesting painting. And the origin of this painting had to do with um, uh, a visit that George had to the Motor Vehicle Bureau in Brooklyn. <laughs> and I think that he was a little dismayed by elements of a bureaucracy. And um, so this is his attempt to depict this world. And um, he's very interested in repeating forms and architecture. And in this case, uh, disillusionment, Dis disengagement, detachment. Um, it's called the Government Bureau. You look at the way the lights work, all in perspective, all going back. I, I think he's a very major American artist. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that's him right in the in the oh, coat because he's repeated? Yes, I th I think it is him. That but it's him him as in every man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the eyes in the windows are terrific. Yes, yes. And and I think I've seen this up at the Metropolitan Museum. They don't always show it, but it's not very large. It's uh I'm gonna guess 18 by 24, or 18 by 28, or 20 by 28, something like that. It's not large. In the same manner as this one is this painting. Um, very brooding and um, uh, intense and um, discombobulating. But again, repeating forms. Not a very large painting, uh, this one, and in egg tempera. Now, this painting, um, if this painting is not a great painting, uh, a masterpiece, it's very close to one. Um, <clears throat> 
it, the color I think is a little richer than this slide. And this painting is about three feet wide. And this is up at the Whitney Museum. And it's a fascinating painting. Um, if I wanted to do a painting about the subway, I would make sure that I had seen this painting because I would want something to be on this level. Um, and this is a very high level. So look at the woman who's coming to you and then all the way, all the way, all the way back is a woman sitting there and the men repeating in slots and the, um, I forgot what you call this, this turnstile where you leave and come in. Mm -hmm. Man brooding, sitting out there, the steps going out to nowhere, the steps going down to nowhere. Um, it's like a tour de force. And um, perhaps, you know, if you were open to this idea, this is where we are stuck um this is another painting of tooker again the light the light is very interesting almost mystical sense of light um Here's another one. <clears throat> now, this painting, I think, is the cover of a book that I have on his work. <clears throat> such a fabulous painting, such a fabulous theme. It's so simple, but yet so complicated. And this is the last slide. <clears throat> this is a, an alternate depiction of this theme before. So, um, any questions or comments? So, I mean, I, I have an association to share. If you could scroll back to 31 for a minute. 31. Yes, 31. So you you may recall, I think it was maybe two classes ago that um, I chose to talk about a, a Tooker painting called the Red Carpet. Yes. If you recall the if you recall the red carpet, yes, the yes. Theme is, the theme parallels this yes, uh, to, right. to a T. You're it's the same right. female figure. Yes. In is sitting on the carpet at three different points in time and yet physically in the same place. You're absolutely right. But yeah. between different things. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Very good. That's terrific. I, I it's I, it's, I like it's wonderful when one painting triggers another. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, that's terrific. Any other uh thoughts or questions? Um how about um I'm going to try to not put you on the spot, but sort of get more of you involved. Um, Mary? Are you out there? No? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Um, oh. You know, it's interesting, the, the 
the last picture you showed of, of the subway of Toker. I, I just got off the subway. <laughs> I walked in and um, it felt just like that. <laughs> really amazing. So it really felt like amazingly real. And also the way the men were like in the cubicles. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like, um, I, I, I think now everybody's on a cell phone, but they were telephone or something. I yeah, just... yeah. I think he's amazing. I, I really, I really relate to him. Um, yeah. Uh, let me see. <laughs> well, who else can I call on? Hey, Simon. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I just was thinking when you were talking about Max Beckman that uh, in the newly reopened galleries at the second floor of the Met. Um, at the top of the big grand staircase, just inside those doors is a big three paneled piece by Max Beckman um, that's on display. If anyone should find themselves going through there, they might be interested to see it. Yes, uh, this reminds me of something I forgot to say, which is that he's very well known for these triptychs. Yes. I think mm -hmm. he did 18 or 20 of them. Very big. And wow. Years ago at the Guggenheim Museum, they had um, a branch of the Guggenheim Museum in Lower Manhattan by around Prince Street and Broadway uh, for a few years. And they had an exhibit of his triptychs there, which was totally stunning, really stunning, like a, full of crazy form, but you couldn't figure out what was going on at least to me, but it was fascinating and full of life. Um, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, sure. really, thanks. Um, who else Who else can I call? Um, um, Jim, are you still here? Oh, no. Um, Hi. Anyone? I'm here. Oh, I'm yeah. Here. Do, you, do you have a thought or a question? Um, I think Tooker is just an absolute genius. And uh, he, looking at Tooker always makes me feel um, kind of uh, desperate, but in, a, in an almost friendly kind of way. Um, I mean, he... Say it again. He makes, looking at Tooker makes me feel desperate, oh. but... <laughs> Um, in a friendly way? <laughs> that what you said? In a friendly way? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think. I don't think being desperate and friendly are are necessarily compatible. What, but, was your, what was the qualifying clause that you said? You said desperate, and then something else. Um, he makes me. He makes me feel desperate because there's. A sense of desperation in his paintings, yeah, and in a sense of alienation, and it's so it's so New York. It's like the person just said she just came out of the subway. And it's, so it's so it's so New York. It's something that we experience all the time, and he um, he he somehow um, pitches it even higher than our normal daily life, which is already pitched high enough, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he's he's amazing. He's yeah. amazing. Yeah, really amazing. Really yeah. amazing. Uh, and he fits into this idea of um, the figurative being influenced by contemporary directions in fine art. <clears throat> Ron, do you do you uh, would you recommend uh, Tooker for one of your clients? I'd recommend a visit to see the real thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. I, 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 so I, I remember my first encounter with with this work. I think it was at in Chicago at the Daniel Terra Museum huh. of American Art when it still existed before his um, very bad financial um, uh, problems uh, with a, uh, a difficult investment. Uh, <laughs> But they're, they're, they're such beautiful objects. And yeah. Yeah. likewise, the Wyeth that, that I, I go back and visit is like, like Mecca at the Albuquerque Museum every time I'm there. 
Yeah. Um, well, does anyone have a question or a thought? Simon, I have a question about the time period. Like you look at the subway one, right? And you're thinking, okay, the age of anxiety, right? Like, I don't know what decade that was painted in, but the ones of like the two figures on the other side of the wall, like the fear and the anxiety is so palpable. And I was just trying to, I mean, these in the bureaucracy, those are sort of of a piece, but then these individual figures who seem so lost like do you know when those were painted what was happening in the world like where was he um <clears throat> i don't have that information in front of me i'd have to like stop yeah I look look and up. look it up and do all that stuff the interesting thing about his work um his early work is more full of tension and anxiety than his later work. This is and um, I, I, I like all of his work, but for my personality, I like the more ten tension-packed works. Um, he, um, he's very, very interesting person and personality. And I, it's too late for me to uh, give you a, a personal example, but if I have time next week, we'll see if I could squeeze that in. But he's a very interesting man. And there are two or three books on his work. Um, they reproduce very well. Um, and they are really objects like uh, Ron said, or, or I thought he said. Um, is there anyone else that has a question? No, but I have one comment, Simon, which is that that quote that you gave from him seemed to me so correct. The after that he was after painting reality impressed on the mind so hard it returns as a dream. Yeah, it, much more than you. You said something about him painting from imagination, but I think much of what we've seen is is closer to that quote. It comes from reality. Yes. Yes. But but. I, what I meant is that all of these figures are not painted from the figures. They're painted right. instead. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he, he writes very well. And um, <clears throat> I, this is not what I wanted to mention, but um, I asked him if he would write for this book. And... Um, he said he would he would do it, but he didn't want me to use it if it wasn't really good. And if he didn't think it was good, he wouldn't send it to me. So I so I waited for a while, a while, a while, and then I I got um, his his epigraph, and it, I thought it would be like a nice two, three page introduction, it was three lines, three lines in length. And um, I had the opportunity to show it to a person who wrote another introduction, which was like two, three pages. This man was the head of the Guggenheim Museum, very interesting man. And I said, you know, I, I've been thinking maybe I should write back to him and say, you know, maybe it should be a little longer. Maybe it should be, you know, whatever. And so the fellow from the Guggenheim Museum, his name is Thomas Messer, he looked at this and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, Simon, this is perfect. You don't need anything longer than this. So, um, uh, yeah, interesting man, really interesting. And, um, I really liked him. Um, anyway, I think that this is good for tonight. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to present this. It's really, it's really a theory that I have, but I think there's something to it. And next week will be the last class, and then um, uh, your presentations or essays or poems or whatever you want to do, and. Um, 
if you have a question, you should send it to me as an email. Um, so I'll see you next week. Okay. okay. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Um, thanks, everybody. Bye. And Christina. Oh, Thank you. Well, I'll I'll write to you. Okay. So take care. Bye. Oh, Bye. I have to turn this off. Yeah. Um, okay. What do I do here? Um, stop sharing. And um, stop recording.